We are now broadcasting live over the internet. Thank you. Hi, Kavita. I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Sure. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you very much. Javier, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Good afternoon. Thank you. I can hear you. Thank you very much. And Casey, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Good morning, everybody. I can see you and I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Casey. I don't think I've said congratulations directly on your new role yet. So congratulations on your new role. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Supervisor. I appreciate that. I'm on my fourth day, so. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. Well, when you're a little bit settled, um, let's let's check in and get coffee or talk outside without masks or something. Without a mask would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. Great. Glad to do that. And Nicholas, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome. All right. We are fast approaching 10 o'clock. I'm expecting Supervisor Wasserman to join us any second. There he is. And Supervisor Wasserman, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Oh, your mic is still off. And 
Supervisor Wasserman, your microphone is still off. Unmute that. Oh, there you are. I see you when I hear you. Enlarge this full screen. There we are. Thank you. Sorry about that, Chair. Not a problem. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, delighted to call this Recording meeting to in order progress. at 1001. It's the Public Safety and Justice Committee meeting of February 10th, meeting virtually. Uh, let's do a roll call vote, please. Good morning, Vice Chairperson Wasserman. Here. And Chairperson Ellenberg. I'm here as well. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll move now to public comment, which is that portion of the agenda reserved for members of the public wishing to speak on any item not on today's agenda, but within the purview of this committee. Do we have speakers, Dave? We do, Madam Chair. We have one speaker currently. All right. Let's give that another second. If anybody else is interested in speaking on public comment, this would be the time to raise your hand. All right. Looks like two. We have two. Correct. Okay. All right, I'm going to do uh, three minutes because uh, there are two folks. So thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, yesterday on the, uh, the side of the uh, San Jose Police Department, um, they had shovel day over there. Uh, putting on the uh, dog and pony show, uh, they got out the uh, the golden shovels, and they had all the big equipment in the background. I mean, it was just a big show um, in regards to the lot E that you know they they basically have had that thing roped off for damn near nine months now, not doing anything. Um, the company that they brought in, um, they're a no joke construction company that basically gets stuff done really quick but they were basically brought in to have the big equipment in the background. Um, so our you know, mayor could do his little show out there. Same with the uh, politicians that are not really doing anything with what's happening at Spring Street. Um, they voted to basically gas everybody out there. Um, that lot E will not be ready for another six months. There are no safe parking programs for anybody that's out there um, on, on Spring Street. I know this is beating pavement and it's saying things over and over again. That place is not gonna be cleared out. There are so many people living up and down throughout the creeks. Um, most people won't walk over there now. Um, there's lots of videos online of drones flying over and helicopters kind of showing how bad it truly is. Um, when, 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 are we gonna, when, when are we gonna do something? Like really, really do something right now. Money came in from the CARES Act. Money came in to help these people because of the pandemic. And, and why is nobody doing anything? Why did we allow it to get so bad? Um, it was brought to my attention the other day that there are rat diseases out there right now that can be transferred to humans. I'm not sure if this has already happened, um, but I'm a little curious why the CDC has been testing rats out there. Okay, um, they pulled out the dumpsters for people to throw away their garbage. So when that stuff starts to pile up, what happens? Rats show up. So now we got some big rats the size of dogs. Um, something is really weird, okay? Other people's pets out there are dying, okay? So not, not only do we have the homeless dying, now we have pets dying. Maybe that can kind of you know throw up a red flag. We treat pets in Santa Clara County better than we treat people. We build, you know, world-class animal shelters, but we don't build a world-class psych ward or a world-class homeless shelter. The money's there. These people are an absolute scam. And seeing Golden Shovel Day out there, that was, that I was just very upset about seeing that. We need a place for people to go. And, and, and they're, they have nowhere right now. And this is not going to play out good for the city or the county. And we're on the world stage right now with this thing. This is not best foot forward, Santa Clara County. Thank you. The next speaker is Angela King. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Angela King. I'm one of the nurses at the main jail. And I wanted to thank Susan Ellenberg for having so much compassion and for really 
uh, looking uh, forward for, um, for real change um, in the custody setting. Um, I specifically wanted to talk about the changes that have happened on the eighth floor um, where we no longer have 5150 holds and we're utilizing 2603, um, which covers us um, being a corrections facility for forced medications. These, uh, uh, these are court appointed, um, uh, I guess, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to say it, but uh, 2603 says that they can give forced medications if a psychiatrist specifically says that uh, they, um, they need them and that they have to be compensated. The problem is, is the court, the court um, hearings keep getting delayed. Um, and what I would like to propose is that they have a rolling movable video court that can be set up in front of these cells. Um, they're, because they're being delayed, we're having mentally ill patients who are further and further and further decompensating, then they're unsafe. The uh, cell doors can't be opened because it's an unsafe environment. Meanwhile, they're in a small cage um, called a cell and they're just unraveling, unraveling. Um, and then their court date comes up, but they can't go to court or they can't be uh, pulled out of their cell uh, because they're, um, you know, it's, it's a safety risk. And uh, and so then the 2603 is further delayed. So they're not getting any medications and it has really turned into um, deplorable conditions for some of these patients. Uh, I saw one gentleman that I know very well over the years. I've never seen him that decompensated, pacing the room, flapping his arms, um, and he's waiting on a 2603 and has been for well over a month. So um, if, if uh, custody, um, health, and uh, the sheriff's department can please work together to not delay these court appearances, but to, um, if need be, bring the video to them because that's where the judge is really going to see um, what's happening firsthand. And he can give those. Next speaker is Jennifer Hughes. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hughes. Uh, I'm a nurse at uh, Valley, Valley Medical at Barbara Aaron's Pavilion in patient psychiatry. And I just wanted to piggyback on what Angela King is saying uh, regarding the, um, the patients in 8A specifically and the, the treatment of them and regarding the 2603 um, delaying them getting their medications. Um, I'm hearing from some nurses it's up to two months and it just seems very inhumane to me that uh, these patients aren't, uh, excuse me, inmates aren't receiving medications that they need. And, you know, just like with any other illness, sometimes longer, the longer the treatment is delayed, it's, it's harder for them to get stabilized. Um, also in, in Barbara Aaron's Pavilion in patient psychiatry at VMC, we have um, court hearings happening through video conferencing. They, um, and also MHAP, they're not coming in, mental health patient rights advocates, they're still not coming into the unit, but uh, they either call in or they can do a video conferencing. So I'm just really hoping that that can happen at Maine Jail as well, that um, the, 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 pa the patients get their, their court hearing and um, that's not, not delayed months and months. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the, the commenters today. Uh, we're going to move now to the consent calendar. Um, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I'd like to hold item eight to the March uh, public safety and justice meeting. It was my error to have included it on today's agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that change, I um, would be glad to hear a motion to approve the consent calendar. Thank you. I'll make that motion to uh approve our consent calendar, which was item number 11, approval of the minutes. 
as well as your request to hold number eight. Thank you so much. Do we have public speakers on the consent calendar? We have no public speakers on this item, Madam Chair. All right, let's do a roll call vote. Vice Chairperson Wasserman? Aye. Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, item four is to receive uh, verbal reports from departments reporting to public safety and justice relating to the county response to COVID-19. And who is organizing us today? Miguel is here. You're muted. Um, Miguel's first, Miguel's first. Miguel is still muted. He's whispering. <laughs> No, nope, still can't hear you. I'm happy to jump in. Okay, thanks. Person. Uh, good morning, everybody. So you'll be seeing me in a new role today. Um, I started my position as a deputy county executive and I'm gonna be handling item number four. So first we will start off with uh, Superior Court. Good morning, Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Wasserman. Let me first apologize and say that the court has uh, several standing obligations for Thursday morning um, and uh, Judge Zayner and I are both booked for nine o'clock and 11 o'clock meetings. So I will not be able to stay on for the duration today, but I will give you uh, my report. Um, first of all, with respect to uh, the COVID backlog, the court is temporarily opening a second traffic department. The court has over 12,000 backlogged cases in traffic. And for six months, we will uh, operate a second a traffic courtroom. With respect to our criminal backlog, the court has over 100 time not waived felony cases backlogged. The court is now operating more criminal trial departments than we did prior to COVID. And we intend to continue to try to uh, attack the criminal backlog that way, while not in any way compromising our other services to our mental health departments, our family departments, or any other parts uh, that the court is currently operating. I will remind you that we are pleased to announce our opening of the Palo Alto facility, which will be open and functioning early May. Uh, again, traffic I think is April 11th and then Palo Alto is the first week of May. And then in what has been a very trying situation and why I'm appearing as I am today, we are currently migrating our computer system. All of our systems have been down for about nine days now. Uh, so we are uh, making part of our migration the public operational criminal links that will be operating in every courtroom. Our target date is March 1st. As you can see from the CAD in my background, things are not going entirely as planned, but we are hopeful that the public will be able to log on by March 1st and have access to public links in every criminal courtroom that's running, I think, a calendar department. The trial departments will be a separate issue and will happen a little later. Finally, I do see my dear friend Matt Fisk on the call, and I want to uh, add that our pretrial services courtroom is uh, exceptionally overloaded and operating very well with the help of the county right now. Um, I think Judge Brown is, if anything, a bit uh, over inundated with cases, but we are pleased to announce that with the county's assistance and particularly that of Miguel as well, that courtroom is functioning at maximum capacity and that completes the report of the court. Thank you so much, Judge Miguel, and, and it's, um exciting to hear about the partnerships across the county that are helping helping us to function quickly. And it was a treat to see the cat. So I'm sure it's not best for you, but works for us. Thank you. Supervisor Wasserman, do you have any questions for Judge McGowan? No, I just wonder why each person doesn't have a cat or a dog in, in their background. All right, let's move on. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, we will hear from the Sheriff's Office. Yep, there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, we will be, um, Sergeant Menchaca will be uh, providing a report and will be able to answer any questions. Sergeant. Thank you, Sheriff, and good morning, Supervisors Washerman and Ellenberg. The Sheriff's Office currently has 33 staff members in isolation with COVID and one in quarantine pending test results. Of the staff members in isolation, 31 are up to date 
or not eligible for the booster, and two are eligible pending their doctor's approval upon completion of isolation. Our staff member in isolation is up to date. Also, there are 127 positive inmates in our care. And in regards to the vaccination compliance, according to the county's vaccination database, as of February 9th, 80% of the sheriff's office is reported as in compliance with policy. It should be mentioned that 20% reported as out, of as out of compliance includes employees on leave, employees who have recently become eligible for the booster and are within the 15 day window, extra health employees who don't have access to work terminals, staff who have recently recovered from COVID and have been advised by their primary care physicians not to receive the booster until seven days have passed since their date, test date and symptoms have fully resolved. Also, several, several staff members uh, have reported as uploading their proof of booster, but it's not reflected in the database as of yet. Specific to the Custody Bureau, according to the database, 74% of staff are reported as in compliance, and the factors for the 26% reported as out of compliance mirror the reasons I just stated. I will continue to work with the vac county vaccination team to uh, ensure that our staff is submitting proper documentation and our staff statuses are reflected accurately. This concludes my report. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much. The numbers are really uh, encouraging and I appreciate your breakdown of, um, of the 20% the and, the, and the 20 something percent um, as really not being for the most part issues of concern, but just process and, and timing. So thank you for that. Supervisor Wasserman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through the chair to council, if I may, in the report that was just given, it talked about so-and-so number of people out of compliance, out of compliance, um, doctor's advice, things like that. Could county council or whomever we have here that's most expert on our COVID rules, for me, many of the people that were just listed I don't understand why they're considered out of compliance. If doctor's advice is not to get a, a, a booster or a shot now, I, I don't understand why that person would be considered, I see Kavita, would be considered out of compliance. I, I understand if somebody's eligible and choosing not to, they're out of compliance. But if somebody's doctor's advice is don't get it now, there were three or four categories I heard listed where I was surprised that they were considered to be out of compliance. Through the chair, if Kavita could respond, please. Yes, absolutely happy to. Um, I don't know the specifics of those employees who were mentioned, but it may well be a, an, a question of documentation or a question of you know technical compliance due to documentation reasons that isn't really you know sort of substantive compliance. I'm very happy to, to follow up on that offline because certainly there are reasonable exceptions for you know documented medical advice and things in our requirements. Thank um, you. I don't want to say more without knowing the specifics for that department, but my guess is maybe it's a documentation question. Thank you because, and, and I'm, I'm glad to see the improvements in the numbers and everything else. I'm just saying that we might need a third category in compliance, not in compliance and pending, um, something like that, because I don't think the sheriff's numbers are as many out of compliance as they needed to, as they just reported. And there might be a need for them to report them that way. And if our rules say, don't get a vaccine at this time, if based on a doctor's advice, I don't consider that out of compliance. Does, does that make sense through the chair to Kavita? It does. I will follow up on that offline with Miguel, um, with the sheriff's office and with my own colleagues. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Back to you, Casey. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move on to Custody Health. Good morning, Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Wasserman. This is our activities for Custody Health Services for COVID. And as Sergeant Machaca mentioned, we do have 127 uh, patients that are COVID positive, and that is down from a high of 278. Uh, we are continuing with our daily testing of all staff. 
Uh, we did have a period about between 1231 and 120 where we were doing testing twice a day of all staff. The reason was we were finding that there was a conversion rate where when folks were testing, uh, they were becoming positive later in the day. And so we started a twice daily testing where folks were testing prior to their shift and then halfway through their shift. Uh, the conversion rate for when we started this at Elmwood, we had a 23% conversion rate between those two tests. And at Main Jail, we had a 15% conversion rate where folks were going from negative to positive. We have since stopped that. Those numbers have come down. As far as our vaccinated staff, uh, we have 100% vaccination and booster on total on our staff. All staff who are eligible for the booster have been boosted. And so we have 100% compliance with that. Um, we have started... Um, antigen testing in our booking area. So as patients are coming in through booking and intake, they are also getting a 15, um, 15 minute antigen test. What we're finding is that we had, when we're doing the PCR, because that takes uh, 12 to 24 hours to get back, we were having staff patients come through uh, that were actually COVID positive. And we found out after the fact, once we got the PCR back. So now we're doing that parallel, we're doing a 15 minute antigen and a PCR testing and booking. And we also are starting to use DSW workers to oversee a lot of our testing of staff and then diverting those extra help nurses uh, to the floor and to other areas uh, where we're needing additional staffing. And that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Dr. Day. Um, I, I'm interested to know about the DSW workers. We heard from Dr. Smith that the DSW workers for the most part were returning to their their home bases and that there would be new hires uh, to do that work. Will new hires be directed to the to custody health as well? Uh, yes, we have talked about that and I have talked to Key Lee. So the numbers that Dr. Smith is submitting, uh, we will draw from those numbers as well. Okay, thanks for your report. Supervisor Wasserman, question. Thank you, I appreciate that. I apologize that I had to leave briefly. Uh, we've had a toilet in the, in the back for three days waiting for a plumber and he just came to the door unannounced. So I hope you'll all understand. I, I just let him in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, we are nothing if not thorough here. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. And next we have a probation department. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> um, I'll turn this over to Deputy Chief Nick Burcher to talk about juvenile hall and rec. Good morning, Chairperson Ellen Berg and Vice Chair Wasserman. Kind of hard to follow the plumbing story here, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, today, currently, we have no youth in custody um, who are positive. Um, we have just a couple of staff that are in the tail end of their uh, positive status right now. Um, as you are aware, uh, we had youth that were at the James Branch that were brought to Juvenile Hall during this surge. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Day and her team working with us and being able to monitor that. Uh, those youth were brought back to the ranch last week on Sunday. And so everybody is back to where uh, they started. Um, cross our fingers that that continues to be as the cases are falling in the county, certainly doing so um, in our work environment. Um, and I'll answer any questions if you have them. None for me, Madam Chair. Good me. job. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nick. And finally, we will wrap up with pretrial services reporting on administrative booking. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Sergeant Menchaca and her five-star team. They've been available to us literally around the clock. And just, I couldn't say enough for the Sheriff's Department and their team, in addition to EOC. I'm happy to say that we're 97% uh, compliant. So that's really good. And all services are up and operating actively at admin booking and pretrial services. We're grateful to be able to say that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. No questions. Thanks so much, Matt. And that concludes our report on item four. Thank you very much, Casey. Uh, welcome again. Miguel? Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. I'm actually going through my phone. So my apologies for that technical glitch. And all I really was going to do anyhow was uh, introduce Deputy County Executive Casey Hutton who started with us on Monday. Um, so my apologies that she had to introduce herself, uh, but we're very excited to have her. As I said, she started on Monday. 
um, and will be providing support to this committee and her, her own host of other assignments. But welcome to Casey, and she did a terrific job. So just wanted to also check the mic here. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Dave, do we have any public speakers on this item? We have no public speakers on this item, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, we don't need a vote, so we're going to move on to item five, which is to receive a report from Chair Ellenberg relating to the alternative to incarceration uh, report and promotes and proposed work plan. So I shall do that now. Uh, at last week's Board of Supervisors meeting, as most of you likely know, uh, my colleagues unanimously approved my referral to dig deep into how we might expand local safe alternatives to incarceration. Long before I joined the board, work was underway to reduce the population in our jails. And I really want to commend the work of our pretrial services, reentry, and the, the reentry work group uh, created by my colleague, Supervisor Chavez, as well as the efforts of our courts, our public defender and, and district attorney's offices for bringing down the population in custody. The pandemic, of course, showed us that when we needed to for, for public health reasons, we could further safely reduce our population. In my view, there are standing public health reasons to keep the population as small as possible, while still, of course, holding people accountable for harm's cause and ensuring justice for victims of harm. So today, I'm going to present a proposed work plan for a year-long impact-focused series of meetings that I expect to result in an implementable, in implementable recommendations to reduce our carceral population further safely and to keep that lower number stable, if not ever decreasing. So let me also just be clear that this work group is not going to relitigate the jail vote. Alternatives to incarceration are critical to moving forward, to moving toward a safer, more just community whether or not another carceral facility is built. This work will proceed because it is extraordinarily important and because it is the right thing to do on behalf of county residents. I also want to reiterate that just as I included a wide range of voices and perspectives in the July 2020 con community conversations led by my team, this work group will also be inclusive of a range of voices. The group will not debate the value or advisability of alternatives to incarceration, but will proceed from the premise that this is the direction already underway in our county and explicitly championed by the entire Board of Supervisors. Stakeholders will be invited to weigh in on how best to accomplish that goal. The proposed structure of the work group will consist of three subgroups that will be made up of no more than 15 participants each. Each group will work within one of three key intercept points of engagement within the criminal legal system. The first group will focus on intervention at the start, and this will span the continuum of crisis, uh, response, uh, citation and release, arrest, booking, and pre-arraignment. The second group will focus on the, really the, the heart of the criminal legal process, looking at arraignment, reconsideration opportunities, case disposition, sentencing, and custody. And finally, the third group, reentry, will focus on release, post-sentence, probation, um, and where applicable, parole. The goal of the process, again, is to identify the specifics of diversion into supportive services, programs, and pathways into the community. Each group may be tasked to develop an implementation plan for our county uh, for, for an implement, sorry, each group may be tasked to develop an implementation plan for county based or community supported community or county supported community based programs that provide alternatives to the current criminal legal system that might be used at each intercept point in their groups continuum. Each group should include representatives from government agencies, law enforcement, the courts community advocates, and directly impacted individuals, both victims of harm and justice-involved clients. All group meetings will be led by a facilitator uh, that was approved by the Board of Supervisors on January 25th. I will be meeting with them later this month uh, to finalize the work plan with your input today and identify uh, group participants. The group should expect to meet 
beginning in April. I will be reaching out to my colleagues for suggested participants, as well as to county departments and community groups. I encourage anyone who is interested in serving on one of the groups to email my office at supervisor.ellenberg at bos.sccgov.org and use the subject line ATI work group. Uh, and I'll need to get those no later than March 1st. Since the group sizes will need to remain small in order to work effectively, please understand if all requests cannot be accommodated. I plan to publicly share the list of each group at the March PSJC meeting and thereafter either I or the facilitator will provide monthly reports on the progress of each of the work groups. Finally, I want us to celebrate work that has been done. I want to acknowledge the many, many partners who have a vested interest in public safety, individual dignity, and care before punishment, and determine collectively just how much farther we can go. So what I'd like to do is look to um, any committee members or, or folks on the screen here for clarifying questions, comments, feedback, and then we will go to uh, public comment. Casey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question. Um, thank you so much for this um, this item. I was had an opportunity to review your work plan today um, and late last night. And I just wanted to ask for the community, the impacted community member, is the hope that these will be um, accused individuals and family members and also victims and their family members, or is it more limited to those that might be accused of crime in their family? I was just curious. Uh, both, both. I, okay. I, I, I did say that, that it would be both um, people that are um, system impacted who have been charged or convicted of, of harm and have finished their, their time in the system and who are victims of, of crime, absolutely both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, District Attorney Rosen. Hi, thank you, Supervisor Allenberg. Um, I thought that the suggested groups uh, should also have representatives from the police chiefs, small business owners, uh, neighborhood associations. There are many neighborhood associations in our county. And I do think that someone from the DA's office should be involved in each of these groups, um, given our involvement in each uh, step in the process. Thank you. Absolutely, I appreciate your, your stepping up to all three groups. Um, when I say law enforcement, that, that would include the, the chiefs. I think the neighborhood associations are an interesting um, um, opportunity. Glad to hear from uh, from other folks. There's certainly an interest there. And sorry, tell me again the third that you said, police chiefs, neighborhood associations. All business owners. Small business owners. And district attorneys. Yeah, got that one too. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that feedback. Other thoughts? Martha. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to let the committee know um, related to the contract with Trace Lunas, the administrative work to get this contract going has begun. And we're currently working with a consultant on the scope of work. So I just wanted to provide that update today. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Martha, I think we should talk as well offline um, to, to make sure that we are all aligned on the, the scope of work. Happy to do that, Supervisor. Thank you so much. Other comments, input, feedback. This is all really helpful. Okay. I'm not seeing other hands or anybody waving. Oh, Chief Garnett. Yes, yes, um, Madam Chair. I, I'll just say that we're um, really happy to participate in any way that you need us. And we've already talked about it and have a few people in mind. So we're, we'll be there and help out. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask you ask you a question, Chief Barnett. Um, this work group was designed to focus on the adult system. I know that we received a, a public comment letter asking to include youth, um, the, the juvenile system. And I would just be interested in hearing your feedback on whether that makes sense or whether the um, issues and programs are, are too disparate. I feel like we have, and I know others on this, um, on the 
virtual dais can jump in, but we already have the Juvenile Justice Systems Collaborative and the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council that review um, funding and, and services and populations. And we have the Juvenile Justice Commission um, who are also very involved. So I, I do think they're, they're disparate. Um, happy to discuss it more, let my colleagues jump in. Thank you. I, I think that that does uh, make sense. I, I know also that we do have lots of other groups that are working in the adult system. And what's going to be really important is that we are all aligned, moving in the same direction, um, not, not creating e either redundancies or, or conflicts in work. So that will be the challenge. And I will expect lots of help and support moving moving that way. Uh, Sylvia and then um, Public Defender O'Neill. Sorry, Independent Public Defender Sylvia Perez. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so yes, I support uh, Laura's position. I think that the juvenile justice system has, as you know, done a lot of that work, you know, 20 plus years ago. And not only do I think that we need to keep them separate, because I think that there's enough progress there but I also believe that um, there's a template for how this work can be done, even though it's not identical to juvenile justice. There are certainly a lot of lessons learned in our history of collaborative um, reform and uh, creation of detention alternatives and reducing the juvenile hall population that I think will be helpful and instructive. Um, to your point about not having to reinvent the wheel, uh, that is going to be a great sort of source of information and knowledge uh, for us. Because again, we've been through it before with the exact same um, people, you know, law enforcement agencies, community-based organizations, government groups, um, you know, everything you can think of that's been done in the juvenile context. And it's not necessarily that much different. Obviously, you know, there are other substantive issues that are different, but it's not, you know, rocket science different. So, I think uh, we could learn a lot from the probation department who is our model um, and not only implementing these programs, but being successful at it. Fantastic feedback, thank you so much. Molly. Thank you, I agree uh, with Laura and Sylvia. I think we, we have enough going on in the juvenile system and <clears throat> we'll have enough people who participate in that to, to get input on how it can inform kind of the, the work groups. And I'd like to see Mr. Rosen and raise him one. Uh, we, we also would like to have uh, staff on all three committees and maybe more than one. Thank you. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, Matt and then Miguel. Yes, I'd like to echo Chief uh, Garnett's words. We, we've seen such progress there. I, I don't think we can fail. I think it's a uh, great representation. It'll give us the depth and breadth that we need to do this. Thank you. Uh, Miguel, then Dr. Day. Thank you. And just checking if you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. Um, so yeah, thank you for recognizing the tremendous work that's been done to date. And it's good to see that we're going to continue to build on it. Um, I think um, this is really hard work. And I guess, um, you know, I look forward to new and creative and better ways and more aligned ways to do things. But I think part and parcel of this, of that, I think this whole system, we really need to also um, approach the work with a willingness to let go of some things that aren't as effective as, as we were hoping, right? I mean, I think true reform work like this does require us to pivot when necessary, take resources that are deployed in ways that are less effective, try to make them more effective. And it can't just be, or in my opinion, shouldn't be, let's add, add, add to a place where, um, you know, it, it becomes confusing. And then we start talking about, well, let's get navigators and other things because we, we've created a system that's too complicated to be navigated. Um, so um, yeah, just a strong plea to say, let's really look at and be honest with what needs to be done, including stopping programs that are not working uh, as we'd like. Thank you. Thanks very much, Miguel. Um, Matt and Dr. Day. No, your hand is up, right? We already did that, sorry. <laughs> uh, Dr. Day. Hi, yes, Madam Chair. And Custody Health Services would also like to be a part of that. All of these, pe all these patients, if we're looking at alternatives, they also 
are coming to us with these mental health conditions, as well as comorbidities. So looking at the population health level and the disease course, I think is critical in looking at alternatives uh, prior to coming to jail to make sure those are wrapped around as well. Thank you. And, and I see uh, Sylvia nodding vigorously there. Yes, I mean, the, the mental health component is such a big piece of, of this that, that ideally is removed from the carceral system if not altogether, to the very, very greatest extent possible. And there we know that there is tremendous, um, tremendous work that we can do because we know that our current system for mental behavioral health supports and substance use disorder spots, spots are filled with bottlenecks and challenges and, and insufficiencies. So yes, absolutely, that's, that needs to be a big part. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, good morning. Um, um, we have a, the reentry center has a really strong lived experience advisory board. Um, so we've already communicated to that group if they're interested in being part of this um, effort, and they are as part of the impacted community member. Um, and uh, uh, regarding um, the letter from Sparky Harlan, I think she pointed out to the young adults, the 18 or 24 year olds. Um, I think that's something that we should be considering in terms of looking at services or what the best practices. Um, the South County policy team has been doing a really great work in those efforts with the young adults. So something that we could apply that moving forward, especially um, with the numbers in the jail and those coming out of juvenile hall so we could um, prevent them from entering um, the system. So um, looking at all of our service providers and we could um, identify the, of the individual that they've served who falls into that uh, age group, and then we could try to pull some data in terms of how they worked and how they ser were served with those per their, those services. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point, and thank you for for highlighting that we really are talking about that transitional um, age position, which ultimately I hope that that folks under twenty five will be considered as part of the juvenile. Um, system the 18 is just too too young a cutoff but but yes that that is a really good point I'm getting a both excited and a little bit nervous about how we accommodate everyone that wants to participate and we're we're going to make it happen and if we need four groups we will do four groups so thanks Javier really good points I appreciate it any other um, any other folks wishing to weigh in? Supervisor Wasserman, did you want to add anything before I go to public comment? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, I think your last statement about how you make all these things uh, happen and meld and work, um, that, that will be an issue, but I'm happy to see so many people saying they want to be a part of this to improve the system that we have. I think Sylvia's comments resonated the most with me, given that we have a system, especially with the juveniles, but we have a system in three different organizations and some tried and true practices that work really well. Um, we have many things that are best practices already. At the same time, I heard Miguel say, and it's okay people to let go of things that we're doing that aren't working. So I think when you take the best practices of Santa Clara County that Sylvia was, was talking about, and you have an open mind that some of the things we do need some tweaking, and this is a good opportunity to do that. That'll benefit the youth automatically, and it'll be part of creating ultimately a better system for the adult um, system that we have, which I think is your purpose, um, your, your ultimate goal. So I, I think we have a lot of things that can happen quickly to improve systems, and I have I think we have other things that will be new and creative. And I look forward to seeing the end result. Thank you so much. And I look forward to, to sharing it and doing the, the monthly report outs. There's so much emphasis right now across the, the state um, on really focusing on, to, on reducing the number of people who are incarcerated. We are learning more science and more information uh, really nearly every day about dangers and traumas and about successful programs, community-based programs that allow people to remain within their within their community. So bringing in 
not only all of the excellent work that's being done here, but perhaps some new voices and advocacy voices and, and folks that are working on this in different areas, I think will be really enlightening, educational, and, and ultimately useful for all of us. So thank you, really appreciate everybody. But go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, did our representative or TIVs from the courts, we have no one at this time, is that correct? I know they said they had to leave early. Yeah, we lost Judge McGowan at 10, but I, I the, the courts to me are a critical um, piece since they are in in the central decision-making seat. Once people are, are in the system, have we, have, when in cases where we have not been successful at diverting people before they even come into contact. Thank um, you. No, so so I will be reaching out to, um, to our judges to ensure participation and, and several have indicated to me that they are interested. Thank you. That was the reason I was asking if we still had one present, because it will be interesting ultimately to hear from the courts as far as the sentencing. I think that's the, the top. That's where everything begins. Somebody be, appears in the courts and then there's alternatives for the judges to sentence people to alternatives, ATIs, um, the acronym you taught me yesterday, the alternatives to incarceration, or if the courts decide a person needs to be incarcerated. And I think these, what ultimately comes out of these three groups you've established may perhaps give the court system several alternatives that they don't presently have. And that's why I was interested in feedback from, from the judges, but that'll come at a later date and I'm glad they'll have representation on the committees you're forming. Thank you, that's all I have to say, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Anybody else? Not seeing any other hands. So Dave, let's go to public comment. Let's see how many speakers, we have six. We're gonna ask if anybody else is interested in speaking, we're up to eight. Now, let's give it a few more seconds. Um, it would be helpful if you are planning to speak to put your hand up at this time. All right, I'm gonna presume that we are set at eight and I will do two minutes each, but to let folks know if, if others join and we hit over 15, I'm gonna shift with number 16 um, to one minute each, just so that we can uh, keep ourselves moving and on track here today. Let's get, let's start, thank you. Next speaker is Nancy Cavalonis. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi. Um, sorry. Hi, I'm Nancy Cavionis. I live in District 1, and I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care Both Coalition. We are in full support of the ATI work plan and want to ensure that it puts system impacted people front and center to create viable, non causable community safety programs. We also want to acknowledge the risk of it becoming nearly a cosmetic process in light of the board's undemocratic and fiscally irresponsible vote to build a new maximum security jail. I also want to add that even though this work plan will not explicitly involve the juvenile justice system, there should be a representative from that division since we know that criminal justice system as a whole often functions as a pipeline. Thank you. Next speaker is Sandra Usher. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Good morning, hi. I live in District 1 as well, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care First Coalition. I'm also a board member at Parents Helping Parents and Community Solutions. I'm a disabled person with an autistic child who has severe mental health needs. I thank you for this alternative to incarceration initiative. People with disabilities represent the largest minority population in US jails and prisons nationwide and have a 43% chance of arrest. Furthermore, more than 25% of those later exonerated after giving false confession to police report having a cognitive disability. These statistics come from the Bureau of Justice. I'm in support of the ATI work plan and want to ensure that it puts system impacted people front and center to create viable non-carceral community safety programs. However, I implore you to add a disability representative to the criminal legal process and exiting incarceration working groups. 
Disability often goes unrecognized or is dis dismissed as irrelevant, and those who are disabled are often offered inaccessible diversion and rehabilitation programs. Finally, please don't let this process become merely a cosmetic process in light of the jail, jail vote last week. I implore you to make real change. Thank you. Next speaker is Lauren Renaud. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lauren Renaud. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care First Coalition. First, I'd just like to say many of us, at least in search, our understanding of public safety and our justice system has been evolving as we've been learning more and more. And I'd just like to briefly thank public defender Molly O'Neill for sharing at the last board meeting about her own experience of changing her mind on the issue of a jail. Because I think it's important to recognize that as smart and informed as all of us are, we should maintain an open mind, as Supervisor Wasserman just said, about things that we may have previously took for granted. So as you saw from the large number of people across the county who showed up at the board last night, last month, and from the detailed, researched, evidence-based letters submitted from your, your constituents with both personal experience, professional expertise, and informed moral conviction, we're here, we're invested, we really want to explore and implement alternatives to incarceration that can help us all move towards our mutual goals of reducing the number of our neighbors who are locked up in our jails. We don't want this process to get lost in the you know, excitement of a, of a new jail construction. We wanna make sure this process is real and comes out with implementable solutions uh, that, will, that will move towards those goals. So we are in full support of the ATI work plan and want to ensure it puts this impacted people front and center to create those viable non-carceral community safety programs. Thank you. The next speaker is Lori Ketcher. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori Ketcher. I live in District 2. I'm also a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and a part of the Care First Coalition. I, I too am in full support of the ATI work plan and ensuring that it puts system impacted people front and center to create viable non-carceral community safety programs and um, agree that a um, representative, a disability representative needs to be present. Also, um, in light of the board's uh, vote on the jail um, and um, which um, based on um, reports is fiscally irresponsible, um, I also just want to say that the ATI process is what the county, your county constituents want, which means that we also expect the process to end with robustly funded actionable solutions for alternatives to incarceration. Um, we are here for this and um, ready to learn and grow and see our community um, and everyone in it become safer. Thank you. Next speaker is Leslie Zeiger. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Leslie Zeiger. I live in District 5, and I'm also a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care First Coalition. Apologies, Leslie, if possible, could you speak a little louder? Your voice is really faint. Oh, thank you. Sorry thank about you. that. Uh, so I'm just echoing what has been said already, really urging everyone in this process to keep an open mind, um, to use your imaginations to do something that we all want. Um, I'm really in full support of this ATI work plan and want to ensure that it puts system impacted people front and center to create, as Lori just said, actionable and well-funded non-carceral community safety programs. And, um, and again, want to acknowledge the risk of this becoming uh, just a cosmetic uh, process in light of the board's undemocratic and fiscally irresponsible vote to build a new maximum security. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharice Domingo. You have two minutes, please go ahead. My name is Sharice Domingo with Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Coalition. Um, we support this comprehensive work plan submitted by Supervisor Ellenberg. We really thank you for your commitment to the community. 
Um, we ask that as the groups dive into the questions, that one of the issues that the groups explore is what county policies or practices are in place that hinder the true realization of alternatives to incarceration. This could be policing practices, prosecution, charging, court practices, sheriff or other law enforcement. We also wanna emphasize the lived experiences of families and be truly heard by that. I also believe that the county really needs to win back the trust of the larger community to truly participate in and believe in this process and be assured that we will be heard. Many of us have been outspoken last week and in the last 14 months on no new jail and wanting to explore alternatives, yet three members of the board and the county exec's office chose not to listen to those diverse voices who participated in various community forums, focus groups, sent in letters and participated in surveys. And just wanna add a thought on Ms. Halkin's comment earlier. Just also wanna emphasize that many individuals who are accused of crimes are or have been victims themselves and have had experienced trauma and hardships. Families who lost loved ones to police violence or are subject to use of force by law enforcement are also not considered quote victims, but they are as well. So the justice system isn't the only way to define who's a victim or someone accused. So I challenge ourselves with that binary thinking and expand on that. And with that said, debug families are looking forward to being involved in this process. Thank you. Next speaker is Kiana. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Hello, good morning. My name is Kiana Simmons and I'm an organizer at the Bill Wilson Center. I am uh, calling to uh, show my support for this proposed scope of work. I appreciate how um, lived experience community members are guaranteed a spot on this working group. And I ask that we also go further and include impacted Santa Clara youth. I heard from uh, the county offices that we don't want to reinvent the wheel on juvenile alternatives and that work is already being done. I, I would say, I don't think that the community feels that way. And um, this is an opportunity to include the youth, to include alternatives to juvie, and we should be open-minded when we have these conversations. Thank you, I yield my time. Next speaker is Tina Brown. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Good morning, this is Tina Brown. I am a system impacted family member here with Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I am calling in for item number five and I wanted to show my support of Supervisor Ellenberg's re uh, report on alternatives to incarceration proposed work plan. My family, as well as many other community members that are system impacted appreciate your humanity and for hearing our voices for much needed change with improvement by allowing this well thought out process of exploring alternatives to take to incarceration to take place. I look forward to the progress and implementation of such meaning, meaningful progressive changes. Thank you for your time. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to very quickly uh, reflect on some of the, the comments. I know that we don't um, generally address them, but I just want to be clear what, what I was hearing and first acknowledge um, that my understanding is evolving as well. Um, I have learned so much and continue to learn and read and listen and grow. So I appreciate all of those who are on this, this journey with me. I can assure you that the work will not be cosmetic. That is not how I work. Um, we are going to have implementable proposals at the end of this year. Um, the, it will then be our job to bring them back to the Board of Supervisors um, to advocate for funding. This, the work groups cannot assure funding. They can assure proposals and we will work together on that. I heard the importance of including someone from the disability community. Um, and clearly centering system impacted individuals and making part of the work a look at county policies that may actually be um, functioning as barriers to alternatives to incarceration. So thank you to all of the panelists and all of the members of the public. Uh, we do not need a vote on this item. So we're going to go to item six, which is to receive a quarterly report from Custody Health Services relating to medical grievances. 
I'm going to pull up my presentation. Just give me one moment. And I'm having a little difficulty getting my presentation. If you could just hold on for one moment. Not a problem. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. And if Dave can be helpful, that would be great too. Dr. Dave, if this is part of the agenda packet, we can try pulling it up on our side if you're having difficulty with it. One moment, please. And Colin, if you could pull that. Dr. Day, do you need us to display that? Yes, if you could, I'd appreciate it. Okay, great. Sorry about the delay. Okay, again, good morning, Doc. Uh, excuse me. Good morning, Chair Ellenberg and Vice Chair Wasserman. And for the quarterly report, Custody Health Services is following up on the chair. Uh, Ellenberg's request for information pertaining to their medical grievances. And this is a similar process uh, that the Sheriff Custody Bureau provided regarding the overall grievance system. Next slide. And as you know, And as you know, the Sheriff Custody Bureau oversees the entire grievance process and runs it through the ACES, uh, which is an ADA compliance and grievance tracking system. And currently the grievances are submitted by patients, either by paper and or electronically, uh, using our electronic tablets. And for all grievances that pertain to custody health services, uh, integrated custody health services to include medical, mental health, and dental, uh, the sheriff custody, they forward those grievances to cu uh, custody health and via the ACES program. Sometimes we do get grievances from our patients that may indicate uh, re a request and or a problem with both healthcare and uh, custody bureau. And at that point, both, um, both custody bureau and custody health will answer those grievances. Next slide. And next slide. And there you go, thank you. And within each medical grievance category, uh, medical, mental health, and de uh, dental, uh, the subcategories, there are several subcategories under each, and those may include accommodations, appointments, care, diet, medications, pain. There are two major categories that we look at as well to include uh, staff conduct and behavior and or any other requests pertaining to mental health, dental, or medical. And each category grievance is then broken down further into subcategories and assigned to supervisors and or those particular disciplines uh, to include medical, mental health, and dental, nursing, clinical care, and any other service uh, that we are overseeing. And we like to preface that the expectation for any of our healthcare staff that are answering grievances are that they take them very seriously, that they do the work, that they examine uh, the requests, and also use professional courtesy in responding. And for custody health, we also receive um, grievances that may go to other business units. And if that is the case, we forward to those business units. Next slide. For all matters pertaining to custody health services uh, and designated staff, they are trained on how to uh, respond to those grievances. Uh, they have to look at the medical record, they look at the course in care, and they assure that any information that they're responding back to is accurately clinically. 
And again, uh, most medical grievances typically pertain to the patients asking questions regarding receiving services, uh, regarding medication, regarding their diagnoses, and we answer those questions accordingly. Next slide. And with regard to providing customer service, um, I, like I said, all staff are trained uh, to provide good customer service. And we look at that as the patient being a partner in their care and so that they are advocating for their own best interests in their care. So we appreciate that. We recognize that when we're responding to the grievances. And we also look at the types of grievances. If they're personnel issues, we take care of those uh, according to uh, any kind of disciplinary that we need to look at, any kind of coaching or counseling. And so we do notify the patients that that has been uh, taken care of, that we're investigating accordingly. However, we are not responding back to what actually uh, occurred with that staff person, particularly if it's a conduct issue. And lastly, if a patient is not satisfied uh, with the response that is given to him or her, uh, it goes into an appeal process and it's elevated to where it may go to a leadership response, a peer review committee response, and or a director response. Next slide. For the calendar year 2021, there were a total of 6,654 total grievances, and that includes custody bureau. Of those, uh, 1,219 were health care to include medical, mental health, and dental, and or 18.3%. Uh, these included a high in February of 24%, and then a low in August of 14.2% of the grievances. Um, the medical grievances for medicine was 83%, for mental health was 12%, and then for dental was 4.5% for the calendar year 2021. Next slide. You can see the variability over the last calendar year uh, from January to December. Uh, there were some spikes, as you can see, toward the end of the calendar year. Taking a look at what that meant and actually uh, any trends that were being established. Next slide. And what we were finding was that when we were tracking the grievances, uh, there were some introductions and we got more grievances since we started the electronic tablets. And so that may have um, accounted for some of the increase in grievances toward the end of the calendar year. We also had quite a bit of uptake uh, with, with COVID. And when we had the Delta as well as the Omicron variant surges, uh, we had quite a bit of uptake with patients requesting vaccines, uh, boosters, and or any other accommodation. And then we also uh, started a vaccine hesitancy program uh, where the patients were getting either $10 for their commissary, uh, for their first shot or vaccination, 30 minutes on their phone cards for second vaccinations. And so we got quite a few uh, grievances, if you will, for patients inquiring about those and are requesting that those uh, be put in place. Next slide. So we have started a quality improvement program. Uh, Custody Health Services is now looking quarterly at all reports and tracking uh, the medical, mental health, and uh, dental grievances. And we are providing a written write-up. We also have codified this into our quality management committees. And so that uh, these records are being codified for the record in our committees and watching trends and looking at opportunities for improvement. And so if you look at the packet, attachment A shows the data by category and facility uh, in the written report uh, where most grievances pertain to medical services and are coming from Elmwood based upon patient population. Attachment B in the report, written report, shows data by category and medical grievances still for, and they still uh, far surpass uh, dental and mental health grievances based on questions of care, appointment, and COVID. And attachment uh, C shows timeliness of responses, where timely, um, timeliness means that we're getting within that 30-day window. Once a grievance is sent to Custody Health Services, uh, we have 30 days in which to respond. And so we've had some variation in our response time. Uh, and then we also are using the data to look at quarterly uh, tracking, examining how to improve the services, how to improve processes, and capturing potential data by category, unit, uh, staff person to see where there's opportunities for improvement. Okay. Last slide. 
And as far as questions, I just want to summarize really quickly for you. To summarize, uh, we continue all of the efforts to provide the best care that we can with our patients. Uh, we're treating not only the grievances as a patient satisfaction, as well as a way for the patient to partner in his or her care. Uh, we're continuing to work in concert with our custody bureau uh, and continuing to assure the collection of the standards are being met, as well as we're meeting the timelines to re uh, report back on those grievances. Um, we understand the importance of the grievance system, of course. Uh, we're actively training staff. We do have dedicated and designated staff uh, that are doing the responses to the grievance, meaning that they have been trained, uh, that they know how to navigate the uh, healthcare record, uh, that they're looking at ad adequate and accurate information when they're responding, and then responding in a timely way. We've re recently, like I said, indicated these quality improvement measures. Uh, that are now being monthly reported in our quality management meetings and being codified in the record. And if there's any action items, we will manage those action items through a formal quality management system and then report back until we're feeling that those measures are being um, met at a high threshold. Unfortunately, right now, since we've started this, we haven't established any particular trends, uh, but we will be looking at those trends closer on a monthly basis for the next calendar year. And that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Dr. Day. Sylvia, single question. Muted. Um, first of all, uh, I'm very impressed with Dr. Day's data collection. It's always um, very impressive. And I think when you're dealing with uh, quality control issues and you want to improve any performance issues in your, in your program, um, or anything you're you're in charge of, having the data available uh, to you is really really important. And so, uh, thank you, Dr. Day, for for doing that and being so meticulous in that approach. I think it's it's uh, reflective of your commitment to improving the services to um, the patients in your care. Um, my one concern in reviewing your um, data was if we have a, a patient in custody who is really uh, feeling in pain and in, is in significant distress, and if they are filing filing the grievance, um, you you have a thirty day standard, um, but that may be really really long for somebody who is in acute pain. Um, so I was just curious how and what kind of triage you have and how mm -hmm. you prioritize that kind of complaint as compared to another kind of complaint that could probably be addressed at a later time. Sure. And part of the process, thank you, Sylvia, for that question. And part of the process is that all of these grievances are triaged. Um, and so that as they're being submitted, we're also triaging them. In the interim, however, mm -hmm. when staff have 30 days to comply, and that's pretty standard in the industry, a 30 day mm -hmm. turnaround time, uh, the patient also has the opportunity to request services. And so they could also submit a white card to be seen. And so they can submit that white card well into that 30 day window uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, depending on what that situation is, uh, we have triage nurses <clears throat> that will categorize and prioritize those for those patients to be seen. Very good. So the, the care doesn't stop because we had the 30 day window to comply. Uh, they also can submit a white card at any time. Very good. Thank you very much. Sure. Did you call my name, Madam Chair? I did because your hand is up. Oh, thank you. I can barely hear you. Okay. Now I can. If you, All right. I think. Yes. There we can. That's regular. Now I don't know what's happening. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Did you. you. Um, I just wanted to say for for all the people here, thank you for the work that you do. When I, when I got here eleven years ago, I got introduced to the homeless situation in Santa Clara County. Started a program, and um, have really made a big big difference. In homelessness here and when I was looking at Dr. Day's list and I'll bring it back up and I'm just putting this out there for everybody on this call just to keep this in the back of their mind but I looked at the next to last page doctor talked about medical grievances by category dental medical and mental and those in custody filing grievances relating to one of those three issues I just want to put out there for everybody the homeless would love to be able to file grievances about dental or medical 
or mental. They are out there with dental, medical, and mental issues, but because they're not incarcerated, they don't really have this opportunity to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting that out in, in the world, and that's all I've got, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Any other? I have some questions, but just looking to the committee first. Um, I'll ask my questions, and then we'll go to public comment. Uh, and somebody let me know if my sound deteriorates again, please. Uh, Dr. Day, thank you so much uh, for the report uh, and the review conducted by, by OCLAM. I think there are some really good procedures in place uh, now for uh, responses to, to grievances that are submitted. The report notes how appeals are routed. Um, yes. But I would, I would like to recommend that we prioritize satisfaction as a metric as compared to timely response. And wondering if there's some feedback mechanism that we could use to see if the person who submitted the grievance feels that their issue was um, satisfactorily addressed. Doesn't mean that they got what they wanted, but that they have a, an answer before marking the item as completed. Mm -hmm. And um, Supervisor Ellenberg, I think that's a great request. And uh, like I said earlier is that, you know, some of these we are using as a satisfaction measure. A lot of the times when you get grievances uh, on the face of the grievance, you're, the patient is not satisfied. Uh, there was something that was not met. Now we have talked about doing a satisfaction survey uh, to um, try to gauge that as well. But I do agree that we need to uh, better understand uh, and, what, and part of what we're doing too with the grievance, not only are the patients getting a response back, but part of the, uh, we're also providing the education. Sometimes a patient may, uh, it may be about run of medication, but because of the class of medications they're taking, they may have contraindications. So the doctor may have to change a medication and do what we call an interchange and or uh, use a different brand of a medication. So sometimes the patient needs to just be educated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I do think that once, you know, and those are resolved fairly easily, uh, but I think that education piece is um, critical uh, to understand why, if, a grief, if an appeal is not uh, overturned, uh, what the reason is for that. And we do go back and provide the education for the patient, but it is a indicator for satisfaction. Good. Thank you so much uh, for that response. Regarding the statistics in, in the report itself, I have just a couple of questions. The charts show just 2021 grievances. How did 2021 compare to prior years, uh, including pre-COVID uh, levels of grievances? Um, I would have to get that information for you. Uh, but we can certainly do a comparative. But that would be helpful in future quarterly reports. I'd like at least a prior year data so that okay. we have some context to evaluate change over time. Thanks. Absolutely. And the data presented shows higher volumes of grievances in August through December, which coincides with the significant periods of outbreak due to Delta and Omicron uh, variants. Do you think the higher numbers in late 2021 reflect issues due to COVID? And if so, are you thinking about any kind of additional categorization of COVID-related grievances? Um, I do believe it had something to do. I think it had a couple of things and we had indicated where uh, the patients started using the tablets and so they had, you know, immediate access to submit a grievance and so I think we had an uptick then. We also had an uptick, um, like you mentioned, uh, during the uh, surges. And part of that, some patients were requesting either, you know, vaccination or booster vaccination. And of course, if they had, if they didn't have enough time between those two boot vaccinations, and or uh, at one point, the, uh, we were not doing the boosters, and there was a part of the period where they were requesting boosters, and we were not providing the boosters. So, and then of course, when we start the hesitancy, the vaccination hesitancy program, or it was an incentive program, a lot of the um, patients were not getting timely those type of rewards. And when we were uploading time on the tablets, for instance, that had a lag to it. And so we did get um, some increase then too. But I do think the COVID um, and the request for boosters and vaccinations, um, we saw an increase in that. And a lot of that is provided based on if they had COVID in the past, we need to wait a period of time before they get the booster, um, those type of things. But we are gonna try to look at and, and sort of delve, delve down 
and look at trends and look at patterns. Thank you so much. And, and given all of that, it, it, I'll offer some direction, but it sounds like you're going this way uh, regardless. I, I'd like to, to see at the March meeting uh, a review of the medical those medical grievances uh, between August and December 2021, divided, um, uh, categorized by COVID and non-COVID uh, related concerns. And within the COVID group breakouts, it would be interesting uh, to note the, some of the most common issues, um, are they testing, access to masks, isolation procedures? You, you sure. gave a lot of those examples. Does that, is next month a, a reasonable request time or does that need to be longer? Um, I just need to make sure that we organize and can pull that data adequately. Uh, okay. So if I need additional time, I certainly will request another month out. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions from committee members? Do we have members of the public wishing to speak? We do have one speaker on this item, Madam Chair. All right, let's do two minutes, please. Oh, my apologies, that person has not put their hand down. We have no speakers. All right, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize for my previous comments were vague. What I was trying to say is, what I was trying to share was the frustration I have that if a homeless person committed a crime, they could receive dental and a roof over their head and, and food. And I know all of you are caring people and you're all doing a great job in your positions and we're doing the right thing and trying to do more right things. But once in a while, this pops out of me mm -hmm. and I, I expressed it when there was talk about iPads and I expressed it in you know, individuals filing grievances. I, I understand that system and are responding Dr. Day to those grievances. Mm -hmm. I think you and your staff are doing a great job. But once in a while this pops right. and I, I have a hard time keeping it in and I know I can share it with all of you. So thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me uh, ramble on. All right, we're gonna move on to item seven, which is- Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Day, did I cut you off? No, oh, I was just thanking you. Great. We're going to move now to item seven, which is to receive a semi-annual report from the Employee Services Agency relating to fiscal year 21-22, extra help usage for agencies and departments that report to PSJC. Good afternoon, or rather good morning, uh, Chairperson Ellenberg and Vice Chair Wasserman and members of the committee. Uh, I'm trying to get my Zoom to cooperate and allow me to join as a panelist. Just give me one moment here while I... No problem, Mitchell. Got lots of that going on this morning. I, I, thank you so much for your patience. I apologize here. This does not seem to be cooperating. Well, we can uh, hear this one. Have me now. There we go. Thank you so much for your patience. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Ellenberg and Vice Chair Wasserman and members of the committee. Uh, ESA would like to submit the uh, semi-annual report for extra help usage for departments that report to the uh, PSJC. And by the way, my name is Mitch Bulespach and I am with the Employee Services Agency, Labor Relations. As you can see for the, the report, SEIU represented classifications have been allocated 74,083 hours for uh, fiscal year uh, 2022. And they have used about 41.8% of those allocated hours. And for the non-SEIU represented classifications, those uh, departments have been represent, uh, allocated 115,836 hours. And uh, so far they have used approximately 53.4% of those hours in the first two quarters. Uh, you know, so far, nothing really seems out of the ordinary or alarming in any of this usage. And the department, ESA department, would ask that the uh, committee receive this report. And I'm available for any questions if you may have them, uh, ma'am. Thank you very much. I, I have no questions. Supervisor Wasserman? <clears throat> no, I don't, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Any committee members have questions? Do we have uh, members of the public wishing to speak on this item? We have no speakers on this item, Madam Chair. All right, report is received and thank you so much, Mitchell, appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we're moving now to item eight, which is to receive a report from the Office of the Sheriff relating to the psychiatric emergency response. 
Madam Chair, was that the one you held? It sure is. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will move then to <laughs> item nine, which is to receive a report from the Office of the Sheriff relating to the Academy recruitment and staffing levels. Thank you for keeping me on my toes. Um, thank you, Chairperson Ellenberg. I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Candelaria, who will be providing a report. Stop. 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 Okay. As a result, Ellenberg and Wasserman, my name is Deputy Blackheart. I am with our backgrounds and recruitment team. Our overall applicant numbers have declined when compared to the previous years. From November 1st, 2021 to January 31st, 2022, we had a total of 183 applicants for the Custody Bureau and 87 applicants for the Enforcement Bureau. As of January 28, 2022, we had a total of 65 correctional deputy applicants and two correctional deputy laterals in our pre-employment process. During that same time period, we had 41 deputy sheriff cadet applicants and zero deputy sheriff lateral in the pre-employment process. Now, we are pleased to share that we recently graduated our Adult Corrections Academy class, ACA 24, on January 6, 2022. We had a total of eight deputies who graduated. Uh, we are now preparing for our ACA 25 Correctional Academy, and we have 22 applicants slated to begin. Um, currently, we have our Enforcement Academy, SEC 29, who is actually going to be having their midterm inspections today. We are excited about that. And there are 17 total cadets. That's all. And any questions? Thank you for the report. I have no questions. Supervisor Wasserman. Sounds great. Thank you. I have no questions either. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We have no public speakers on this item, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, then item 10 brings us to announcements. Um, I would like to just quickly share that uh, I'll be at the National Association of Counties meeting next week, and there are a number of proposed interim resolutions that um, potentially impact our work. So I just want to briefly share that uh, I will be supporting a proposed interim resolution supporting legislation and, administra and administrative waivers to lift the Medicaid inmate exclusion prior to reentry. I will be supporting uh, the proposed interim resolution uh, supporting the 988 um, uh, phone, phone line implementation and comprehensive behavioral health crisis care uh, and will not be supporting the proposed interim resolution in support of qualified immunity. And that is the announcement that I have. Do any other committee members, panelists have any announcements they'd like to share for the good of the order? Being none, we will adjourn to March 10th, 2022 at 10 a.m. Thank you, everybody, so much for your engaged participation today. Take care. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you. Recording stopped.